So that was nice, right? Good, yeah. Good, thanks. He is wonderful. And, uh, and the evenings are really wonderful evenings. So if you have a one free, try it. It's, I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, okay, now, this evening. Remember the series is entitled Masters of Journalism. And um, the, rea the, the real story is that um, we did have one person who we were really hoping would be our guest for this evening. And uh, he was really trying until the bitter end to work out the schedule, and it didn't work out. So we looked around to see who was a real master of journalism, and of course we found a person right under our feet. Um, but we want, but we also um, wanted to to do something else, and that is that that we will be adding another evening to the series in the spring. And those of you who have tickets for tonight, we will invite as our guests to that evening. So um, we're just, although tonight's going to be terrific, it always is when when our lecture when the lecturer for tonight speaks. Um, so look for that in the mail. You will be getting something from us in the mail as soon as that evening is set. Okay, good. Oh, that's good? Good. Okay. So far, so far, so good. Uh, now I get a chance to actually do something that he always tells me I shouldn't do. I get to do a full introduction of Jeff Greenfield. So here we go. Jeff Greenfield is ABC News political and media analyst. Since 1983, he has been working at the network at ABC, where he appears primarily on Nightline and where his weekly commentaries are seen on World News Sunday. His work has taken him from South Africa to Japan to Europe, but he is principally known for his work covering domestic policy, I'm, I'm sorry, domestic politics and media. Since 1988, he has served as a floor reporter for national conventions, as an analyst on every presidential debate, and as an election night commentator. He has twice been named to TV Guide's all-star team as best political commentator, and in 1996, the New York Daily News named him most valuable player on its all-star team of TV political reporters. The Washington Journalism Review named Jeff Greenfield, the best in the business for his media analysis, and he has won three Emmys, two for his work on South Africa, one for his profile of Ross Perot. Apart from his television work, he is a contributing columnist for Time Magazine, and his magazine pieces have appeared in publications ranging from the New York Times Magazine to Harper's to National Lampoon. He is the author or co-author of 10 books, and in 1995, his first novel, The People's Choice, became a national bestseller and was named by the New York Times Book Review as one of the most notable books of the year. And if you haven't read it, you really should. It is phenomenal. He is now at work on his second novel, eagerly awaited, at least by me, um, a satirical portrait of big media. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jeff Greenfield. So now we know who the real friends are. <laughs> so, um, there are three stories that can explain tonight, two of them inappropriate, one appropriate. The first involves, uh, the two of them are political actually. The first involves Earl Long, son of Huey and himself governor of Louisiana, who was about to make an announcement of a new tax that flatly violated his major campaign pledge. His press aide said, Governor, the press is out there. They want to know what's going on. What should I tell them? And Earl Long looked at the press aide and he said, tell him I lied. <laughs> That's not what happened. The second story involves Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who um, in making a major commitment to aid the Allies in the run-up to World War II was reminded by one of his aides that he had flatly said this was what he would not do at a specific speech in Pittsburgh. He turned to one of his aides and he said, what do I do about this? The aide said, deny you were ever in Pittsburgh. <laughs> this is also not appropriate. I was indeed here two weeks ago. So the third story, which comes from the movie Little Big Man, which really says what happened tonight. In the, near the end of Little Big Man, Chief Dan George announces that it is time for him 
to die and to be taken up into heaven and to join his ancestors. And he lies down or lays down on the ground and chants the magic incantations that will end his life and bring him to the life after life. And nothing happens. And after a long moment, he gets up and brushes himself off and he says, well, you know, sometimes the magic wor works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, we are going to make it up to you in the spring. It will not be me again. We might bring Jerry Siegel back or the Cleftones, depending on the demo. <laughs> depending on the demographics of the audience. So that left me with two choices tonight. I could either sit down and talk to myself, which I often do, but if you live in New York and ride mass transit, this is an everyday occurrence. <laughs> so I actually thought, well, since this series actually is pursuing a theme in part about changes in the media and changes in how we cover the news and what we consider news, I decided to make lemonade out of this lemon, in terms of not having a guest, and offer you a more full-throated version of my take on it. Um, I will refer back to some things that were discussed with George Will two weeks ago, and next week when Russell Baker shows up, and he is booked, uh, I would remind you that Russell Baker spent many years as a political reporter and columnist, and I'm hoping that there's some kind of thematic union, and that's why I wanted to do what I'm doing tonight. We are going to take written questions. Uh, ushers are passing among you with the traditional index cards. So we'll make it an evening. <laughs> All right. And the least that I owe you uh, to begin with is as candid and open an assessment as I can make about what I have come to consider the dirty little secret about political journalism and politics in general that I think is being shared by an increasing number of people who have spent their lives working in and fascinated by American politics. I may have told you this before at another time, but just so, just so that you know, as they say, where I'm coming from about this, I speak as someone who got hooked for a life uh, in politics at the age of nine, listening to the 1952 conventions on a battered AM radio at my grandfather's cottage in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, finding in the tumult and the shouting and the battle for power an absolutely intoxicating diversion. Uh, I had originally was trying to find out where the baseball games were on the radio and th the conventions were on and then I thought they were more exciting than a, than a pennant race. And for me, it as for many of my colleagues, it became an obsession and then much of my life's work as a speechwriter, as a political operative, as a journalist and as an author. Uh, I am one of those people who watches C-SPAN for erotic pleasure. Um, <laughs> and uh, the plot of my first novel did not involve, you know, one of those normal political Hitler, is the, is, the Hitler's brain has been put inside the president who was from Mars, but it was a, a, a novel about a quirk in the electoral college system. <laughs> you know, I, as a diversion, I should tell you that when, when, uh, when the people in Hollywood optioned this movie, I thought then, as I do know, that they were out of their minds. Uh, and all I can tell you is, if they ever make this movie, I know it will turn into one woman's struggle for self-esteem set against the uh, <laughs> backdrop of the uh, war in Iraq. <laughs> but frankly, as they say, you know, if the check clears, I don't care. <laughs> but it's with that background in mind that I tell you that in my view, we are now <clears throat> in what is almost certainly the least interesting the least consequential and the least significant political period in American politics in my lifetime and quite possibly in this century. Now I grant you that's not a compelling way necessarily to begin to talk about politics in the media. You know, it's not how you go out and sell. On the other hand, I think our politics has become uninteresting for some very interesting reasons, uh, which is a conundrum. And as I have said before, I oppose the distribution of conundrums in our public schools. <laughs> because our kids still can't find Mexico on a map, so first things first. <laughs> but the point is, if you look at the roots of this flatness, of this lack of interest in politics, I think we can discover some, some significant things about how politics has changed and how the media has changed, have changed. And I think there are some aspects about this that, that ought to give us some serious pause. Now, I don't think you have to look very far for the evidence of this 
malaise or this lack of interest. Last year's elections, just if you can remember them, <laughs> the conventions which, which the broadcasters covered with, with less coverage than ever before in history got the lowest ratings in the history of televised conventions. The three networks combined in the first three nights shared collectively 10% of the viewing audience. That is, of those who had their television sets turned on, 90% of them were watching something other than the conventions. The debates, which in 1992 had drawn the largest audience since the very first Nixon-Kennedy debates, when, when Ross Perot showed up as the first third party candidate, four debates in nine days in a contested election. Last year, the debates were the least watched in the history of American presidential debates, and not so coincidentally, the voter turnout in the United States, which is historically low compared to our European uh, brethren and sistren, but the voting turnout in 1992, which had gone up, over the last election, plummeted to the lowest since 1924, the uh, compelling Coolidge-Davis election that I'm sure we all remember <laughs> so well. And, but what's interesting about this, to me at least, is that so clearly has the American public turned its attention away, not just from elections, but from the whole business of public policy, that, that some months ago, a dozen or so prominent Washingtonians wrote little essays in the New York Times News of the Week in Review, more or less begging readers of this most prestigious publication to please, please pay some attention to Washington. So what's going on here? Well, the, the conventional explanation is that really there are no compelling issues out there. There's no Cold War, there's no threat of nuclear annihilation, there's no depression, there's no recession, there's no divisive war abroad, there's no bitter conflict at home, the cities aren't burning down, the campuses aren't burning down, there is no scandal that at least as of yet threatens to topple this president, uh, though we do keep an eye on that from time to time. <laughs> and in this case, you know, normally when somebody says the conventional wisdom, they're about to tell you why the conventional wisdom is wrong. I think the conventional wisdom is largely right. I think the public, to use one of my favorite stories, is like the proverbial eight-year-old child that never talked. Uh, he could read, he could write, he was perfectly bright, but he never said a word in his entire life. And one day he, he came down to breakfast and took a bite of his cereal, looked at his mother and said, you know, Ma, this oatmeal is cold. And the mother said, you've never talked before. And the kids said, you know, up to now everything's been fine. <laughs> Obviously a hypothetical child, but that's another story. <laughs> well, but for Americans now, most of them, the oatmeal is relatively warm and tasty. And that's, that's an important factor. But I think it would be a mistake to limit our vision to the fact that most of us feel that we live in relatively peaceful and prosperous times. Um, I think to understand how we got here, we have to look at how we in the media came to cover politics and how the interplay between politicians and the media drained the process of so much of its vitality and excitement. I, in no sense do I suggest this is a, the product of some kind of conspiracy or even bad intentions, but I think it has left our public life much the poorer. Now, broadcast journalism was born as we know it in the late 1930s when Edward R. Murrow and his remarkable collection of colleagues fanned across Western Europe and Central Europe to cover the rise of Hitlerism. That story was compelling for two reasons. First was technological. No one had ever heard voices from the other side of the ocean in their living rooms or kitchens coming to them as it was happening. That alone was an amazing phenomenon. Most of us around here today don't remember the birth of radio, but those of us who are old enough to remember the birth of television know what that felt like. I mean, in the early days of TV, you'd watch anything, wrestling, roller derby, for the sheer excitement of pictures. Well, that, that was to some extent what was going on with radio journalism back then. But the second reason is the story they were covering was about a threat to the peace, a threat to freedom, and within a few years, a story about millions of Americans risking their lives all over the world. Now, you don't need a focus group to tell you that's one hell of a story. You don't have to persuade people to pay attention to the news when their sons or fathers or husbands or brothers are 
are risking their lives in combat, the outcome of which will determine the fate of freedom. And over the years, it seems to me, we lived through a series of events that were, that were both significant and compelling. That is, they were great stories, exciting, dramatic stories, and they were significant. The Cold War with the threat of nuclear holocaust, the civil rights revolution, wars in Korea and Vietnam, in the late 60s, domestic upheaval on a scale unseen since the Civil War, a generational divide, a racial divide, a constitutional crisis involving the, the ouster of a president. This is, this is compelling stuff. And politically, if we just confine ourselves to politics, the media discovered how remarkably dramatic it could be to cover live the process of choosing a president. The first radio convention was 1924, when it took the Democrats in the old, Mad the old, old Madison Square Garden 103 ballots to nominate a president. I somehow don't think we would stay with that story for the two and a half weeks it took, but you have to admit it was a pretty interesting story. The first real TV conventions were the ones that I heard on radio in 1952 when, when in the Republican Party one of the most important splits between the Taft and Eisenhower wing, wings exploded in front of the, literally, well figuratively, exploded in front of the country. Um, some of you who, who were, were around then might remember a scene where Everett Dirksen, leader of the Taft forces with that voice that was the voice of God, looked down over the rostrum at Tom Dewey the 1944 and 48 candidate and the leader of the Eisenhower forces, and this is going on live, and he looks at him and he says, we followed you before and you took us down the road to defeat. You know, imagine that happening at a convention today. <laughs> Unthinkable. The first real radio president, of course, was Franklin D. Roosevelt, who, who figured out that this relatively new medium was best used not in orations, before a hall of people, but talking one-to-one, -one, hence the chats. And what was he talking about? He was talking about how are we going to get out of this depression, and he increasingly began to talk about what are we going to do about the menace of Nazism. And if you read Doris Kearns Goodwin's wonderful book, No Ordinary Time, you'll see stories in there of people walking through their neighborhoods on a summer night when all the windows were open in those pre-air-conditioned days, and when Roosevelt was speaking, the people could walk down the street of the neighborhood and never miss a word because every radio was listening to the president. And they were listening to the president because he was talking about big stuff. Um, I remember feeling something of that emotion in the fall of 1960 as a freshman at the University of Wisconsin, gathering with my friends to watch the first televised Nixon-Kennedy debate. Um, Remember, nothing like that had ever happened in American history. Pedants among you should know that if you cite Lincoln and Douglas, I, that was not a presidential debate. That was a senatorial debate. That's why I watch C-SPAN a lot. <laughs> and in fact, the actual differences between those two candidates were astonishingly small. For a small charge, I will stay here afterwards and describe to you the difference in their views on whether Kimoy and Matsu should be defended in the event of an attack from China. It's compelling stuff. But the point is, the issues seemed immense. And in fact, beyond the divisions between those two candidates, they were. Was the Soviet Union going to become dominant in the world? Is there a way that we could preserve freedom and preserve the peace? And this wasn't rhetoric. I mean, it wasn't just rhetoric, because two years later, if you want to talk about a compelling story, in October of 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, on that same campus, a philosophy professor said to us in our seminar, well, I'll see you Wednesday if there is one. And Samuel Johnson supposedly once said that the, the news that one is to be hanged in a fortnight concentrates the mind wonderfully. And you know, that week, a lot of young people watched the news, just as they did 17 years later when the draft lottery was announced. One of the reasons I never believed that Bill Clinton couldn't remember his draft lottery number was that anybody who was eligible for the draft in those days remembers that number more than they remember anything else in the world. <laughs> now, television was very good at covering these kinds of stories because it, it could communicate the excitement and the consequentiality and the drama all at once. And it is, as the Stalinists used to say, no accident that in 1960, the year of those first televised debates, the first election in which television was really in most American homes, as a matter of course, 
That election produced the largest turnout in the history of America. We haven't equaled it before, we hadn't, and we haven't equaled it since. About 62% of eligible Americans went to the polls that year. So what I'm getting at here is that television and the media were delivering news about government and politics when it mattered, not just who would win, but what they would be called upon to do, whether it was extending basic civil rights to black Americans, the restoration of civil order in the United States, the preservation of the peace, all major issues. And there was something else about those times, something that George, Will, and I talked about briefly a couple of weeks ago. Whatever your ideological beliefs about government, there was a stretch of time, 30, 40 years, when most Americans believed the federal government to be an engine of enormous change. It was the federal government that tried, that tried to boost this country out of the Depression. We talked two weeks ago about Hoover Dam in the midst of the Depression, the largest public works project in the history of the world since the pyramids. This amazing thing that literally harnessed unharnessable forces of nature. And then the government that fought and won the Second World War that created Levittown and the Levittowns across the country that made suburban home ownership a reality. The government that created the Marshall Plan that saved Western Europe, the GI Bill of Rights that took eight million Americans and brought them to a point where that was unthinkable a generation earlier. College education, the key to the middle class, and the interstate highway system, and the, and the mission to send men to the moon, all done with some success by the federal government. So in covering that government, the media were covering an institution that most people thought mattered a great deal and could actually do some good. As I've mentioned here before, you know, it wasn't that long ago in historical terms that the statement, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, was not the punchline of the joke, name the biggest lies in the world. <laughs> Others of which I will not get into here. So what happened? Well, a, couple, a lot of things happened. One of the things that happened that I don't think we pay enough attention to is that the politicians, seeing the power of television, began to adapt themselves to television so much that it wound up that what we were covering was not the substance of an event, but a shadow play. I mentioned earlier the conventions of 1952. One of the things that hit politicians right away was that the normal conduct of a convention, hours of speeches, delegates sleeping on the, in their chairs with newspapers over their heads, and general carrying on, demonstrations that lasted for three and four hours, this was not good television. And as early as 1956, people think of the Republicans as the party that likes to beat up the press, and today that is mostly true, but in 1956, there was outrage at the Democratic National Convention when two of the networks refused to carry a packaged television tape that had been produced as a piece of political propaganda. Even back then, the parties were beginning to realize they had to adapt themselves to television. One of the least remembered incidents from that not particularly well remembered year in 1956 is that in order to make better television, the Democrats had two kids who'd won a fortune on the $64,000 question come up to the rostrum and do a little sketch making fun of the Republicans. Even back then they understood, why don't we use this device to sell ourselves? And particularly after 1968 when the, when the process of picking the president moved to the primaries, the conventions became less and less significant. These events the television had rushed to to cover, because this is where the president was going to be picked, was no longer the venue. And yet people like me still wandered the floor, as we do to this day, wearing those idiotic <laughs> Mickey Mouse earphones, looking for what? <laughs> we looking for the powerful political party bosses that will hold the key to the second and third ballot switches? Well, the last multi-ballot convention was back in 1952. This doesn't seem like a very sensible thing to do. I mean, you know, it was a, a, once the dream of playing for the Yankees and you know, backing up uh, Little Richard went. The other childhood dream that seemed to make sense was I could be a political reporter at a convention. And I got there to find that there was no news. And, and it's not just me. I mean, every time I'm on a convention floor and see these earnest young men and women running around with two cell phones and a pager and a beeper and a satellite dish on their heads, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> and I'll tell you what they're doing now. You know what they're doing? They're trying to get their bosses on television. <laughs> you know, you mean, if you're, you're a floor reporter for a network, let me tell you, 
What happens about 20 times a night is somebody comes up to you and says, you know, the congressman would be very eager to talk about it with you. I, I'll bet he would be, you know, because there's nothing else to do. And so what happened is the, as, as the news got less interesting, we began to cut back our coverage. Some of us can even remember gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. And then two hours a night, and now an hour a night. And so the parties decided, well, wait a minute. If all we're getting from television is an hour, and there's nothing going on here, why don't we put on a show? Kind of like the old Mickey Rooney movies. Hey, I got a convention hall. Let's put on a show. <laughs> and that's what they're doing. The Republicans put on the Oprah Winfrey show last time, starring Liddy Dole as Oprah. As, you know, the only memorable thing in that convention was Elizabeth Dole wandering the convention floor with this encomium to her husband as she stopped along the way interviewing people that remembered Bob Dole and the good things he did. The Democrats, in my view, were worse because what they decided to put on was the Jerry Lewis telethon. <laughs> I don't mean to be unkind, and I have, you know, but the truth of the matter is if you think back to that convention, if you weren't a victim, you didn't get on the podium. <laughs> Even the keynoter, the, the, the poor benighted Evan Bayh of Indiana, who, who was, followed Hillary and spoke mostly to the retreating backs of the delegates on their way to dinner, had to begin by talking about the illness of his mother. You know, now that might be interesting television, and it, it certainly is a worthy cause, but what in heaven's name does it have to do with politics? I mean, let's mercifully put aside for a moment the example of Al Gore, <laughs> who, who in 1992 invoked the specter of his injured son, the victim of an automobile accident, and compared the injured son to the American economy. Last year, you will remember, we got an incredibly, incredibly emotional speech about the death of his sister from smoking cigarettes, which left out only the fact that four years after his sister died when he was running for president, he ran throughout the South boasting of his close ties to tobacco. Point is, it was supposed to be great television. Walter Cronkite used to say that we have to cover the conventions because it's a civics lesson for America. When he said it, he was right. Who could make that case today? And yet, even as this has happened, the media have grown geometrically. Every local station, every news network, every, every newspaper, every radio station sends people to the convention because that's where the news is or was. And, and now, not only the conventions, sends them into the primary states because that's where the nominees are selected. Once upon a time, like 12 years ago or less, a reporter like me could go up to New Hampshire, a month or so before the primary, sit in a living room and listen to a candidate, schmooze with the electorate, uh, and you'd, you'd sort of be the only guy there. Maybe there'd be two others. Uh, I remember following Gore around in 88 when he ran for president. In a couple of places, we had the only camera crew. We could set up in the corner of a living room, there'd be 40 people there, and you'd actually get a, a sense of, of a political exchange. Forget it. Not now. You go up to New Hampshire within 100 days of that primary, and you go into a living room where the candidate is meeting the voter face to face, you will see about 20 voters and about 100 reporters and cameramen and lighting technicians and sound technicians. On one occasion, uh, things got so crowded that a poor real voter, which is what we call them, when they, they can make their way through the mob, oh, a real voter. This one real voter made the mistake of sitting too close to the cluster of lights. The late arriving other network guy showed up, knocked the light stand over, and cold cocked this poor woman, <laughs> who fortunately was okay. But I'm telling you, if this keeps up in the year 2000, you will see the first fatality caused by the sheer omnipresence of us. Now, you might think, oh, this is hyperbole. Say not so. My favorite moment from the New Hampshire primary and it crystallized what I'm talking about for me, and we even managed to preserve this on tape, on Nightline, came the, the day that Pat Buchanan decided to go to a, a freezing cold New Hampshire day, but I repeat myself, uh, <laughs> showed up in Hanover, New Hampshire, looking for voters on Main Street. Now, the people of New Hampshire are a lot smarter than the politicians and journalists. That is, when the temperature hits, oh, 25 below zero, they stay home. <laughs> Which is really, you know, it's pretty smart if you think about it. 
I can go in and freeze my butt off, or I can stay home. Okay. So what happened was Pat Buchanan came out of his van, you know, that he rides in, and we came out of our, uh, poured out of our buses and stuff, and lo and behold, on the streets of Hanover, New Hampshire, that freezing day was one voter. And Pat Buchanan honed in on this one voter. And we, all 40 of us, surrounded the two of them. You've seen these shots with the boom mics and the lights and the camera. And this poor guy thought, I think he thought it was an Iraqi you know, terrorist <laughs> attack. He was, he was just doomed. And as they walked down the street, you know, 20 of the reporters are doing this and 20 are doing that. I mean, it was everything, but it was like a disgruntled poster worker, you know, with the rifle jammed into this poor guy's neck. It is idiotic. Now, something, else, something has happened because of this, though. Something else beside the mere over-coverage of the story, and that is that politicians, by and large, with rare exceptions, have become so petrified by what they see as our power that they have turned themselves into controlled walking sound bites. One of the things I am convinced television in general has done, partly because we've become a more national culture and partly because they think they know what they're supposed to look like, is that all of the characters, the, the oddballs in politics, with very few exceptions, have disappeared. It doesn't matter whether you talk to a congressman from California or New York or, or Mississippi, you're going to see the blue suit, the blue shirt, the red tie, and the $50 haircut. And they're going to talk so they've all been taught by their media consultants, whatever you do, stay on message. Which means that no matter what you ask, you will get the same 10 words. I mean, people made a lot of fun of Vice President Gore for the no controlling legal authority line. You know, that when he, he said it was okay for me to make phone calls because there are no controlling legal authority. But they all do it. They all do it. I sometimes, I've actually made the suggestion in a moment of despair tonight, and I said, why do we have to book guests anymore on politics? Why don't we use hand puppets? <laughs> Save a lot of money, and I know what they're going to say, you know? Most corrupt administration in history. No controlling legal authority. Most corrupt administration in history. <laughs> they're all taught to be so controlled that you get no feeling of authenticity about these people. It, it, try, there are two phrases that you should, next time if you watch one of these things like Crossfire or meet the press, or this week, or any of them. Watch for these two phrases. First, when you ask somebody if, if they're troubled by anything, you know, like indictments of 20 of their top aides, or their... <laughs> the line will always come out the same. They'll say, not at all. <laughs> I don't know why, somebody taught these guys, that will reassure the audience. They don't say no, or well, a little, it's always, a, not at all. <laughs> the second phrase, is a phrase that is now used to mean the precise opposite of what it's supposed to mean. And that phrase is, frankly. <laughs> now, frankly used to mean, I'm about to say something that might be a little embarrassing to me, a little embarrassing to you, but I feel I had to say it. Frankly, that dress adds 20 pounds to you. <laughs> frankly, this is not my best work, you know. Frankly, I overslept. That's how you use the word frankly in real life. Here's how politicians use the word. Frankly, my plan will benefit all Americans. <laughs> Frankly, my opponent is just desperate. In other words, self-servingly is what they mean. But somebody's taught them that since people distrust politicians, say frankly and they'll believe you're being honest. Now, how do we respond? And indeed, how have we helped cause this? Well, the more politics on television has been played to an audience as though it was theater. The more we have decided that the way we serve the public is by pushing the curtain aside and look behind the curtain to see the stagecraft at work. Um, it is often blamed unfairly on, on Theodore White, who in the making of the president in 1960, showed us the, facet, the romance of politics and the behind the scenes stuff. And when Teddy White was doing it, it was new, and he also paid a lot of attention to the substance of what was being talked about. Not anymore. The question that we always ask now is, why did that politician say that? The, the possibility that that politician said that because that politician believed that, <laughs> forget it. No, 
they're after the Southern vote, they're after the Catholic vote, they're after the Jewish vote, they're positioning themselves to the center. Everything is analyzed through this prism of complete and utter manipulation. You know, if, if, this, were, if this were 50 years ago, Maybe if in a moment of weakness, I might say, in a desperate bid to win the support of European immigrant-based voters, President Truman today announced the Marshall Plan. Well, you know, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> but maybe there's, you know, maybe there's another way to look at it, like, is it a good idea? Um, we don't do that. We just assert that everything is done out of political motives, and that if you, if you talk about the actual policy implications, it's a sign that you're a sucker. And now add into this the change in the, in the tone of coverage, which is way beyond politics, and you see where the cynicism leads. When I was a kid, a, a topical political joke, I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, was Bob Hope kidding around about Eisenhower's golf game. You watch Leno or Letterman or Saturday Night Live these days and ask yourself if the only thing I'm hearing about Bob Dole, let's say, is that he's a senile old man, and the only thing I'm hearing about Clinton is that he's a man who can't control any of his appetites. How, you know, is there any wonder that maybe the public begins to say, you know, this is not, this is really not a process I want to spend a lot of time thinking about or involving myself in. Am I going to give up an evening, canvas, make phone calls, go door to door for this? And that's assuming, by the way, that any, anybody's left doing that. Since politics has increasingly become something we see in 30 second and 60 second commercials. Now, one thing about commercials is they may work, they may change your mind, but you don't really, unless you really have a problem, you, you don't get emotionally involved with your deodorant, right? <laughs> I hope you don't really form a strong bond of loyalty to the soft drink you drink. And that's what politics has shifted into a commodity because that is where it is being presented to us. Not actively in town halls and union halls and neighborhood meetings, but up there on that screen. Now, I am not arguing that the good old days were cleaner or more noble. I don't believe that. I think politics today, in fact, is probably more honest than it ever has been. Uh, in the days when, when senators would dump cash from lobbyists on their desk in the Senate and dole it out. And it is certainly less scabrous. You don't hear too many people calling their opponents dupes of the communists or you know, race mixers or ca Wall Street goons. And it's also true that maybe it's a good thing that we are more independent from politics. You don't rely on the local community leader to get you a, a holiday turkey or to get your kid a civil service job. Maybe this is an American version of Karl Marx's utopian dream. You know, he used to say after communism was around, the state would wither away. And I think what George Will was suggesting last week was that maybe it is a sign of health that, that our national politics seems to have become so much less consequential. And, but, you know, that's possible. But we ought to remember something about the roots, the political roots of this country. That is, we are two people at once. We are very individualistic, which is why we've never really had a successful socialist movement in America. We, we privatize many more things than, I mean, Europe, no European conservative would think about privatizing, say, health care. You know, that's who we are, but we're also very communal. You know, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 established public schools in the new territories. Lincoln took time out from the Civil War to establish land-grant colleges that sprung up all over America. And yet today, we live in a time when we have less and less in common. Part of this is prosperity. You don't ride the subway if you can afford a taxi, and you don't ride a taxi if you can afford a private car service, and you don't ride the railroad if you can drive to work, and you don't live in an apartment uh, beyond the most elite of New Yorkers if you can afford a fancy house in the suburbs. And even the common experience of watching the same thing at the same time is vanishing. You know, there was a time when television and radio were, were, the, were dominant, that everybody listened to Jack Benny, to Amos and Andy, to Milton Berle, to, to whatever. Except for the Super Bowl now, we don't have that anymore. You know, we have this abundant Jeffersonian community that, that some people celebrate, and it may well be worth celebrating, but think of the consequences. Think of how much has changed about how we experience information. Because one thing about politics, if you're into it, is it takes a little time. You gotta, you gotta absorb what people are saying. I am too young to have experienced, say, coming over 
uh, in an immigrant steerage ship. I'd never crossed the plains on a covered wagon. So when I want to tell my son about the privations of my youth, I say to him, you know, Dave, when I was your age, we only had black and white television. <laughs> and the biggest set you could have was 12 inches. Really? And we only had seven channels. Seven channels. Seven channels. And you know what, Dave? If you wanted to change one of those channels, <laughs> Uh, your kid, no, you had to get up and you had to go all the way across the room. And you will remember those of you, this was a schlep because you were required to sit, you know, 10 feet away or you would go blind. <laughs> now the point about this is that, that the, you know, there are two things about the invention of, of, the, of remote controls and the expansion of television universe to dozens of channels. One is, is of course, it, it, it does separate the genders out one of the last gender specific things. You give a remote control to the different sexes and you will learn men graze, women nest. <laughs> but the more important difference is what it has done to the attention span. You know, it, it, I, don't, I don't mean this in at all flip. If, if it is an effort to get up and change the channel of your television set. One of the consequences is you'll sit there for maybe, maybe for two or three minutes and listen because you don't want to get up six times in a minute and flip. And that means that people have time to get your attention. Now, <laughs> pew, pew, pew. You know, I've caught myself doing this on a, on a board eating. I'm suddenly, I, it's, you know, it, it's like some kind of disorder because you can't, you can't, you know, of course, given what's on television, you're not missing much, I'll admit. <laughs> but, you know, if you sometimes wonder why we in the media yell at you so much in these promos, these horrible 10-second promos, today, Thursday, it's incredible, you won't believe it. It's because, <laughs> it's because we know you're sitting there with that device. <laughs> and we don't get your attention quickly, and we're, do we're toast, we're done. Now, think about what that does to political discourse. Think about, you know, if we're not presenting information in as leisurely a manner. When was the last time you saw a 60-second commercial, by the way? They don't exist anymore, hardly. They're 30-second commercials and 15-second commercials because your attention span is shrinking. Now, what does that do? Well, one thing, one, some years ago, a graduate student at Harvard actually looked at the coverage over the years and discovered the following, that in 1968, the average soundbite given to a major party candidate for president was about 45 seconds on the evening news. By 1988, it had shrunk to eight and a half seconds. And these are the people running for president, you know? Eight and a half seconds. The only thing we have to fear is f <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you get a dialogue going with the public in that, kind of, in that kind of environment? How do you do that when there are dozens of channels screaming out at you that they've got stuff that may not be important, but boy, they've got stuff that you can't resist, you know? Whether it's OJ or Marv or John Benet or the nanny or I don't know what's coming next. Because what's happened in addition to all these changes, fuse that with what I would argue is the fact that what is important is no longer compelling and what is compelling is not important. And if we don't cover the circus on the networks, we know you have 30, 50, 100 other choices. Remember, back in the days when See It Now was a top 10 program, one of the reasons was not just because of Edward R. Murrow and how great he was, because there was nothing else to watch. And now there is. The night of, of uh, the President's State of the Union speech last year was the night the O.J. Uh, civil verdict was announced. And thank God for Los Angeles traffic because the verdict actually wasn't announced until a as the President was finishing. And the networks made an, a common decision that they were going to stay with the State of the Union speech. If that, something like that were to happen five years from now, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel that that would happen. Now, I want to finish up so I can get to your questions. but. Maybe what all this means is that the media have simply decided that political stories are yesterday's news, that we don't cover them for the same reason 
that New York newspapers no longer send their reporters out in tugboats to meet the ocean liners coming back from Europe to ask statesmen if there will be a war, because <laughs> you're not going to get a lot of response. You know, maybe it's just not what's happening anymore, but here's what I worry about. If we decided that this area, that this whole arena, doesn't matter anymore, except to kind of a handful of us, sort of hobbyists, if there's no common arena where we care about what, if anything, we believe as a people, then what happens if hard times arrive again, either economically or socially? I mean, if we assume that sooner or later the business cycle might turn, or if we assume that sooner or later something will come along that will divide America the way civil rights did, or Vietnam, or immigration, or the Klan, or prohibition, or free and silver versus, versus gold, then what happens if we've lost the very concept of learning about what is happening and watching great decisions made together? I mean, what happens if, to take Doris Kearns Goodwin's example, we walk down a street and we hear not one voice of a leader grappling with a dilemma, but a hundred voices? Some from the network, some from the net, some from cable, some from pay, wherever. And if we, what happens if we've lost the ability to even imagine that this leader might have something worth listening to? Now, maybe, and it is still my faith, maybe the public is not quite as narcoleptic as the politicians and some of the media think. Maybe the low voter turnout has to do more with a search and a hunger for an absent, honest dialogue. And the question is, in this day and age, the question I would leave you with is, are there political figures today willing to speak to us in that honest voice? And if those politicians show up, do we remember how to cover those voices? And if we do, will there be anybody out there listening? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going I'm I'm to run these things through, and then we'll We'll, uh, here we go. If we reform campaign finance, can't we eliminate election by soundbite and turn elections back to issues? Um, I'm really skeptical that any, any reform would do that because, look, nothing, there is nothing even now to prevent politicians from speaking to us in a different way. One thing I would point out to you is that for, in, in the 1992 election, whatever his other week, shortcomings, Ross Perot went on television with 30-minute commercials using easels and a pointer and gave incredibly detailed arguments about, for instance, the deficit. And one of the reasons why we are now, for good or ill, moving toward a balanced budget is because Ross Perot put that on the agenda. And uh, you know, one of the reasons Ross Perot could do that was, as a gazillionaire, he could spend as much of his own money as he wanted on his campaign. So I don't think, and, and you know, the, a lot of the proposals now for free airtime involve letting the politicians do for free what they now pay for. So a 30-second or 60-second commercial that's free is not particularly more substantive. I think it's going to take, I think what it's going to take is, is somebody, if, if there were a Ross, if Ross Perot had been <laughs> stable, Or as someone described him, you know, if, if, his, if his seat back and tray table had been in the full upright <laughs> mock position, I, I think he could have posed a tremendous challenge to the, to the existing politicians, not on the basis of how his campaign was paid for, but on the basis of how he was pr proposing to argue to the American voter. Why don't politicians ever answer a direct question with a direct answer? Well, because they've been taught not to. And I used to be one of those people. I mean, we had a somewhat, somewhat different way of saying it, which is whatever you're asked, make sure you answer the question you want to answer. Uh, and it's now been refined into, in, into what you're talking about. There are a couple of politicians out there. And it's when, whenever you see the press going crazy for a politician, it's generally because they do this. And they, it, it's like giving a glass of water to a man dying of thirst, or a woman. One of the reasons Bruce Babbitt, who I know is now in some trouble, but in 1988 was so adored by the press was that's what he did. He, when he ran for president, he just said, here's what I think we have to do. Um, one of the things that, that I thought, I, what I loved about Perot was he was arguing for a huge increase in the gasoline tax in one of his television shows. <laughs> and he, he came to that part of the thing, he says, okay, here's the one you're not gonna like. 
We're going to have a 50 cent a gallon gas tax. Still make our gas cheaper than all in Europe. We need it. We need it to cut people's dependence on foreign oil. Got to do it. Well, now, you know, that's direct. Um, the two people of national stature now who I think qualify for that are John McCain of Arizona and Bob Kerry of Nebraska. And one of the reasons why both of them, uh, you may have seen Michael Lewis's piece in the Sunday Times Magazine on McCain. It was uh, the biggest, wettest kiss I've ever seen a journalist you know, deliver in public. Uh, and it was because McCain does that. Just tells you what he thinks. And Bob Kerry is, a, is astonishing. Bob Kerry, and he, some of you folks may not like what he's about. He's, he really thinks entitlements are going to kill us if we don't put the brakes on them. But he's willing to say that. Now, of course, one of the questions is, one of the questions that, that always intrigues me about this discussion is that people always say they want that. But that they also say they want more documentaries on television. <laughs> and if a politician directly and honestly told you something that might affect your interest, do you think you'd vote for him because of his honesty? The politician said to you directly, you know, affluent people have got to give much more back in Social Security than they're given now. It's the only way to make the system work. That's a very direct statement. You think if you were in that position, you would necessarily embrace it? I don't know. We may find out if Kerry runs for president again. But uh, anyway, please comment on David Brinkley's comments about you. Uh, would you believe me if I told you his comments were really about President Clinton? When I said nice things about Brinkley, he was so steamed about Clinton, he said, well, one of the things I learned was brevity. And that had come on the heels of President Clinton's 45-minute victory speech. Um, I realized how it looked, but I am sure that he didn't mean me. That's my feeling, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, let me just see here. I, are you going to accept Don Imus' job offer? <laughs> well, as I told him on the air, now that the minimum wage has been raised, I'm not sure he's going to stick by it, but uh, no, I'm not. Um, the title of the series, Masters of Journalism, implies that longtime experienced journalists develop a certain mastery, at least in part because of their tenure. Harkening back to George Will's comments on term limits, would there be any benefit to limiting journalists, especially TV pundits, to only 10 years on, on network TV or op-ed pages? How about doctors? Let me skip the second part. Um, I'm not a big, I, we didn't get into this because I thought it was a little too, um, arcane, actually, and it's an issue that is fading. I happen to think George went from the right to the wrong side of that issue. I've never understood the argument for term limits. Uh, I think the 22nd Amendment is a terrible idea. You know, if, if Bill Clinton, at the end, in three more years, turns out to weather all these scandals and is presiding over a healthy and happy country, he will be a 54-year-old man who, even if we wanted to, we couldn't reelect. And somebody has to explain to me why that's a help to democracy. I don't, mean, I don't believe in the indispensable man or woman, but I think, I think that's weird. I also think it's weird that in three more years, a 57-year-old Mayor Giuliani will not be able to run again, even if most New Yorkers think he's doing a great job. I don't think that's democratic. Um, I also find it a little ironic that the people for term limits include Newt Gingrich, who's been there for 18 years, Strom Thurmond, who's been there for 43 <laughs> years. You get the gist. Um, having said that, I do think that we have too few voices in the media. I would love to see a much more expansive dialogue. I'd like to see people from, more people from, uh, if, if we have a radical left in America anymore, I'd like to hear some of that. I'd love to hear people more from the libertarian right. How do you feel about Hugh Downs walking off 2020 for Walter's Marv Albert interview? I thought it was pretty neat. You know, he didn't make a big deal out of it. He had made a sta public statement saying, I wouldn't talk to him. I'm sure Barbara wouldn't. When Barbara did, he said, well, that's fine, but I'm, I, I think it would be, you know, I'd go against everything I said. So, you know. Uh, about eight years ago, Nightline did a show on Madonna because one of her videos had been kept off MTV for, if you can believe this, sexual explicitness. <laughs> and Koppel refused to do the show, and I refused to do the piece and it got the highest ratings of the year. <laughs> See, this is the part of this discussion that I always find interesting. It's, it's where um, we, we never bring, I don't mean you personally, we never bring the audience into this discussion as part of the reason for this, you know? Um, 
the only person I ever heard on television ever say a critical thing about the audience was Ernie Kovacs decades ago who looked out after one of his shows and said, thank you for letting us into your living room, but couldn't you have cleaned up a little bit? <laughs> I sometimes feel that way. Um, uh, you know, yes, it was a great thing that Hugh Downs did because he was true to himself. Do, you, do any of you doubt what the ratings were for Barbara Walters' Marv Albert interview? They were, they were huge. They were huge. Well, I'm sorry. What? Oh, thank you. You mean Hugh Downs, not Marv Albert. Hugh, um, <laughs> Hugh Downs simply refused, to, it would, it was not part of the 2020 show Friday, not part of any of the show. He just took, he took the day off because he was uncomfortable with the interview. And it's, you know, it's a good idea. Will the 2000 election refresh our interest in issue-based politics or will we focus on candidates' past indiscretions? Um, for one thing, that depends on the candidates. And I think this thing needs to be put on the table. You know, it's not every candidate that gets vetted for personal indiscretions. Because believe it or not, many candidates don't have them. Um, I covered the British elections where Tony Blair was compared frequently and nauseatingly frequently to Clinton. Roughly the same age, same new kind of change the party. But Tony Blair has had this, by all accounts, wonderful marriage to a barrister, a lawyer, uh, who is kept out of the spotlight. He is a deeply religious man, or at least religious enough to, to take his family to church most Sundays. There was not been a breath of scandal, a financial or, until this week about a campaign gift, but until at, at the time of the election, nobody raised questions out there about you know, what Tony Blair was doing in the back of a car in a parking lot, because there were no questions. If um, there are no questions as far as I know in terms of personal stuff about Al Gore. And I, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna be raised. I mean, even though there is this appetite for the lubricious, uh, candidates have to, have to, there has to be a threshold reason why, why the press begins to look into that. I mean, you may have noticed there wasn't a lot of personal stuff, at least in the sexual area, about, say, Michael Dukakis. Um, there was a rumor about his, his wife, indeed, which turned out to have a basis, as we later found out, in fact. Should ABC air the Hearst documentary, My Appraisal of the Book? Haven't seen the documentary, haven't read the book. That, that um, I can only tell you that the thing that strikes me about the reviews so far are the number of people who seem to feel that Mr. Hirsch overreached uh, and that what was new in the book was unproven and that what was proven was basically not new. Uh, I have my own theory, but you know, which is that I think he thought he was after bigger game, namely, I believe, based on what I'd been hearing over the years, that he, he was, he was believing that he was going to get to the bottom of the assassination, that he was going to, quote, solve it or find out what really happened. And lacking that, the book turned into what it is apparently turned into. Um, I'm not going to answer questions about Iraq because I don't know anything about it, okay? I wish more of my colleagues would do that. <laughs> no, I mean, I just, you know, I, I could stand up here and repeat what the New York Times said, but most of you have read it and it would be a waste of time. Um, but boy, I'll tell you, you know, you gotta, you gotta figure out, if you have to have an enemy, you know, he's like, a friend of mine said he's like one of those guys in the World Wrestling Federation, you know, Saddam. <laughs> he's just so totally whack job evil, that, you know, it's, I mean, I haven't noticed a lot of committees, you know, like in the Vietnam War, there aren't very many people rooting for Iraq. <laughs> but that's the extent of it. How did we get to a point where the negative forces, <laughs> that is Republican, okay, <laughs> holds so much more sway than the positive or liberal forces, read Democrats. Read the article in today's Times about the judges who probably won't be appointed because the Republicans don't want the deck stacked with liberals, like they wouldn't stack the deck with ultra conservatives. Well, notice first, can we parse this? <laughs> Negative Republican, positive Democrat, liberals, Ultra conservatives. Where'd that come from? Why not liberals, conservatives? I think this is what's what's gone on in this. Um, we are in the Congress now. We are engaged in what I hope may come to an end at some point of uh, one of these kind of Hatfield McCoy feuds, and 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 that people keep going back and saying you started it. 
Basically, we went through a period when the Democrats ran the Congress and the Republicans held the White House. And on a number of very famous occasions, um, most notably the defeat of Judge Bork and the near defeat of Judge Thomas, the, the Democrats rallied their forces to defeat the, the Republican nominee. And in the, at least in the case of Robert Bork, there was no argument about qualifications. The argument was that he was outside the mainstream. The Republicans have neither forgotten nor forgiven this, and they are using what power they have to, to um, give back in kind, particularly on the nomination, not so much just of judges, but of uh, Bill Lan Lee, who is now not going to be the civil rights enforcer. However, since you read the New York Times, you will also notice that part of the problem in this is that the overwhelming majority of court vacancies now are, exist because the president has taken an average of 600 days or the better part of a year and nine months to fill them. Um, but this is, look, this is a case where, this is strictly a case of whose ox is gored. When the, when, the when the Democrats held the Congress and the Republicans held the White House, the Republicans said, if the guy's qualified, then that candidate should be confirmed. And the Democrats said, no, it's our job to look at ideology and belief. Now it's flipped, and Ted Kennedy's making the opposite arguments, and so is Orrin Hatch. Um, but I don't, you know, we, uh, George will point this out two weeks ago. We live in a, in a system that is designed for gridlock. It's just that divided government now has taken on the reverse of what a lot of us remember. Um, what do you think of our president? Congress. Uh, <laughs> uh, I... It's a complicated question about Bill Clinton, and I'm going to try to answer it uh, honestly. He has two of the three gifts that could make a great leader. That is, he is incredibly smart and tied into the, to the nuances of public policy debate, and he loves it, and he has a tremendous empathy with people. I mean, Jimmy Carter had the empathy, I mean, rather the policy, but no, no, not the empathy, as did Michael Dukakis. Ronald Reagan had the empathy, was not exactly in tune with the, the details <laughs> of public policy. Um, but what, the, what, what Ronald Reagan did have, and what Bill Clinton, I believe, has always lacked, is a very clear sense of what he wanted to do other than the job. I mean, Bill Clinton can describe it, but when you get down to the, when you listen to him, the terms are so broad as to be meaningless. Um, and that was a little easier in Reagan's time because what he wanted to do was he wanted to resist and if possible roll back Soviet hegemony in the world, if necessary by spending them into bankruptcy, and he wanted to reverse the growth of the federal government. Now those are, you know, that's very clear, very understandable. And basically he always knew that about himself. He could make compromises, he could tack, he could, he could fall back, but basically that's where he was going. I don't think, maybe it's the Times, maybe it's Bill Clinton. I remember having this discussion with a journalist in New Hampshire in 1992 who was very high on Clinton and saying, you know, he, I mean, he may well win this, but he's going to be a marginal figure. Now, in part, that's not his fault. We don't have a war. We don't have a, a great vision. But I think he is basically a presider a marginal figure, very attractive, very compelling sometimes, but basically marginal. Um, you know, that's, that's, he's got three, it's funny, he's got three years left in his term. And if you said to somebody, because people have had these conversations at the White House, well, where, what do we, where's it going the next three years? You get, you know, standardized tests? I don't think so. I don't think, I, don't, so I think it's very hard to figure out a, a, a message, and I don't think there is one there. Something else I'll tell you, I'll share with you, with the proverbial unattributed source. A guy who was down in Washington for Hillary's 50th birthday, who was a former administration official. And I said, uh, so he went down there, he said, yeah, he said, the difference between the two of them is that Hillary's a real friend. You know, if you're in trouble, she'll stand with you. And by implication or omission, you sort of got the sense of who wouldn't. And no, it was not Harold Ickes. 
I just thought I'd share that with you. Notwithstanding your assessment, which I think is correct, that the political terrain has become flat, do you think the quality of the writing, the quality of the reporting, and or the depth of the stories printed in the New York Times has lagged? If so, why? Um, no, I think it's changed. Um, I think the New York Times, like every other paper, is struggling with how do you stay relevant in a time when there is so much more competition for, for the audience's attention. I mean, we're talking about a remote control and how hard it is to get people to watch four-minute newscasts. Well, outside of people like us, and I don't mean that in some snobbish way, people raised on the New York Times, people I was taught in, eighth, in seventh grade library class how to fold the New York Times. <laughs> it was assumed that you were going to go through life reading this paper. And now you have, and, and at the time, what was the competition? The competition was other newspapers, but you know, the idea, I mean, look, step back for a second. Go back 20, 20 years. No CNN, no C-SPAN, no Jim Lehrer News Hour, no MSNBC, very little cable. No, you know, the internet sounded like some hairspray. <laughs> very different time. And so what the Times is trying to do is to adjust. Um, you know, I, I'm one of those people who did not feel that when they published color photographs, the world was coming to an end. On the other hand, nor did I think this was the great salvation of newspapers. You know, I hate to break it to the Times, but we have color television. And, you know, so the idea of seeing a color picture is not like, whoa! <laughs> Just, it, but why not, you know? And, and they're working, I, I am told, somewhere in the next 20 years, they may figure out a way not to get the ink to come off in your hand. Um, and like all people, you know, well into middle age, I don't like change. I mean, I remember when the Times was two sections. Now it's 20 or something. And I can't stand it because, you know, I, but I swear to you, one of these days, if I see Arthur Sulzberg, I'm gonna say, would you explain to me why you don't know that first comes A and then comes B and then comes C? I mean, is there, is there something you guys haven't yet figured out yet about how this is supposed to work? The answer is they're trying, they're trying to become a paper for the times that their readers have grown up in. So sure, there's more feature stuff on the front page because there's less compelling political news, just like for us in television. Um, but I, I think, I think that the, the Times coverage of, of political events is, is, always, is and has always been pretty good. I mean, the paper that I read more than any other, paper that I feel I have to read more than any other, is the Wall Street Journal because while their editorial page is extremely, as it should be, opinionated, their, their news stories and their, you know, are, and political coverage is absolutely first rate. But no, I don't, you know, I think we all, all of us, I get a chance to say this every so often, <laughs> the fact that this talk suggests that we have declined in, in political interest should not be read as a wholesale statement that everything is getting worse, which is generally the, you know, as you get on, the tomatoes aren't as good and, air isn't as good and the hills are tougher to climb and, and all of those things, you know. It's, there's a lot of stuff that's better. Politics really is cleaner than it was. And um, the fact that you don't have to be a white male Protestant to ascend to the highest reaches of American power is a, is a good thing for a lot of reasons. Um, and the subways are a lot better than they were, you know. They really are. So it's, it reminds me a little of the line from Atlantic City, the movie, the, the movie where this young guy has never seen the ocean. He's walking with Burt Lancaster, and he's saying, God, he's walking on the boardwalk, and he says, that's just an amazing sight. And Lancaster says, you should have seen the ocean in the old days. <laughs> you know. you know. I don't, uh, I don't much, we'll just take a couple, a couple more. I was recently upset by the way the media reported Clinton's attendance to the gay and lesbian dinner they accused him of only attending because of a hidden agenda and a pandering for votes. Isn't it possible he did this because he believed in it? Would it be better if he didn't go? Why won't the media give Clinton credit for anything? Okay, that's a couple of questions. Yes, it is absolutely possible that Bill Clinton went to this dinner because he believed that it was the right thing to do. No question about it. Um, he's done that on occasion. The most, um, you know. <laughs> 
the most, the single best moment in terms of a public speech that Bill Clinton, in my view, ever gave was four years ago to the Houston ministers, a black a organization of mostly black Baptist and AME ministers, in which he said, if Martin Luther King were alive today, he would say, I did not live and die so that 14-year-old kids could shoot 10-year-old kids for their jackets. It was a speech about violence, particularly violence in black communities. And it was a tough speech, and it was to the right audience, and he clearly said it from the heart. So yes, and I, and I, I think, by the way, that, mo that what you're talking about, the questioner's talking about, is that if you don't like Clinton, and you are opposed to the notion of, uh, that, that of gay civil rights as an equivalent of black and women's movements, then you will say it's pandering, you know? But it's not, I don't think it's fair to say that the whole press covered it that way. It clearly was a, an important event because no president had ever, no sitting president had ever spoken to a, a group like that before, ever. Um, so, you know, I, I think you have to um, give a little more credit than that. But I do agree with you that generally, I mean, certainly the president thinks he doesn't get credit for anything. Um, but I think I mentioned, um, well, two weeks ago, you know, that you could, you could make a list of things that have happened under the president's watch and say, so, what are you complaining about? You know, unemployment, productivity, inflation, lowering crime, lower divorce rates. He may not get all the credit, but, you know, think of what you'd say if, if, if those numbers were reversed. Uh, do, you, do I think part of the apathy I you talk about has to do with the conservative movement toward, toward states' rights and that the federal government should not be interfering with local affairs? Actually, no, because I think that fight could be, if people cared, if, if, if it touched people's um, basic concerns, you could see a big argument about that. I mean, the civil rights movement was basically how much power should the federal government have versus states' rights over things like voting and education. That was a pretty hot issue. So I don't think it's, I don't, I do think that, that um, you could argue that the conservative attack on government, per se, that is the idea that government, as Ronald Reagan said in his inaugural, is not the solution to our problem, but it is the problem, certainly means people, more people believe that, the less they have faith in, in big government programs. That's, that's probably true. But, you know, the conservatives turned out in, in, in many of the recent elections to be much more enthusiastic about voting than than liberals. The 1994 election, the, the reason why the Republicans won is the conservatives turned out their voters and Democrats basically stayed home because they were bored. Um, if I can take that question and spin it a little, if the question is what could you imagine would be, the, would be a kind of issue that would get people stirred up that wasn't, you know, war, depression, you know, economic crisis, social catastrophe, I'm very hard pressed to to um, offer you one. Because in my view, if, unless you have a figure, a leader who can encapsulate what people are, are feeling and angry about, assuming they're angry about anything, and, and put it on the agenda, it's not, the media's not gonna do it. It's not, we're not good at that. People think the media set the agenda. I've never believed that. I think it's a way exaggeration of, of, our, of our power. Um, I had thought, I thought a, a sane Ross Perot could have done it with campaign finance in 92, and I thought Colin Powell could have done it in 96 about, about the restoration of, of, of civility in government. I think people would have responded to him big time, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't the case. Let me just see if there's one more, and if not, uh, no, I think, I think that's going to, I think that is it. So let me just end by saying I really appreciate you showing up in the absence of someone else. <laughs> I would thank our guest, but that's a little silly. <laughs> and tell you that barring, you know, uh, how do they used to say it? Good Lord willing and the crick don't rise, as we used to say in Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> Russell Baker will be here next week, and on December 9th we will have Mike Wallace, with or without musical accompaniment. So thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.